procedural bylaw. Um, we would look to the chair to be chosen by the members present. Would council like to nominate someone to chair this meeting? Councillor Strachan? I'd like to nominate. Do I have a seconder? And council's in agreement. Any opposed? All right. Mayor McDonald. <laughs> Win-win situation all around. Um, 
it, we happen to have a representative from uh, Point to Point Communications, uh, Mr. Scott Kett. Yeah, site, or sitcom or sitcom services is a division of Point to Point, and they've been doing this a long time. And uh, it's going to greatly improve our communication system. It's going to upgrade our communication so we can get into the digital era, if I can say that. And at the same time, we're going to be coming in under budget. As Councillor Files said, we'll be uh, entering in the, uh, uh, the town of Pantang machine has uh, uh, provided a capital contribution to this that will allow us to link our, our communication tower with their communication tower and that will give us each a backup and we'll kind of act as a, uh, as a, whichever one comes first, whatever one we can hit the best, it will pick up our signals and work for both of us. So, and then with uh, SiteCon looking after the, the tower and uh, providing rental to other agencies, that will be a revenue stream back to the town. Uh, come for me. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for your report. Um, the only question that I had reading through it was, um, you guys had came up with a, a new model so that, uh, as as you said, um, uh, they're going to be in charge of the maintenance and that th uh, that sort of stuff, the upkeep. The only question that I had was in terms of um, revenue, and it said that they're going to be in charge of. Uh, looking for revenue opportunities for other probably, I mean, I'm going to guess if it's a power other telecommunication providers and the revenue would be split 70-30 uh, or 75-25. Was there any analysis done um, on our end saying, well, that maybe it might be better if we upfront the cost because that is going to pay back in the long term? Uh, or is it more speculative that there may be some telecommunications down there that might want to uh, hop on the tower, if you will? Deputy Chief, too. Thank you. I think uh, the idea is, is point to point or site comms are looking for a, um, a site here to put their power and to, you know, to increase their revenue screen, screen, sorry. And we are upgrading from what we originally, originally we were going to put up a 100 foot tower, which was a, a lower end tower. They're going to put up a 140 foot tower, which would be probably awfully a lot more expensive to do and probably wouldn't be done at that point. And so we're, they're putting up what they call a CSA tower versus a non-CSA tower, which is a lot more expensive, uh, expensive to uh, accept the load of additional antennas that they want to put on. So I think it's a, an expensive thing. It's also expensive for the ongoing site maintenance of the tower. This, this is something that they have to do on a yearly basis to make sure that the tower is still safe and not going to fall down. And that's a very costly thing. SiteCom is going to look after all those expenses and there's no expenses to the town at all. Uh, just a quick question, uh, Chief Tool. Uh, do you have access to that power, easement to that power at any time? Yeah, that's affirmative. It's uh, it's on the it's going to be on the town town's property. Okay. It's um it's going to be at the Wilson Road water tower site. I don't know if that's what you actually refer to it as. It's going to be within the compound of, of the water tower, and uh, we've been over this with uh, Sean from operations and uh, everything seems to be in order that way. Good. Okay, uh, Council, uh, this issue will uh, come to council, council in the month. Getting on with the agenda, the uh, Section B, Operations and Engineering Matters, Thank you. Uh, the first item on this agenda is uh, engineering development design standards for sidewalks. It's a report actually uh, that was prepared by um, Alpin, our summer student, and it uh, looks at a number of uh, options around the uh, design standards for sidewalks. You recall that uh, we were asked to have a look at that to determine whether or not we would maintain the existing uh, specifications for sidewalks that are currently applied to new developments. And uh, our engineer is uh, recommending as well as supporting option one. So if there are any questions, uh, he would be able to better answer those questions. Councilor, any 
we've had this discussion before when we talked about sidewalks and this business and houses. And I've argued before that when we create sidewalks that are too close to the property line, we create a large green space between the curb and the sidewalk. Essentially, that large lawn, in my mind, is a dead space. It may be green when it's there and it holds snow, but it's not a place that people use. It's not a place that people enjoy. You never see them walking by, playing by, gardening. By pushing the sidewalk out to this area, to this limit, we have created these in front of everything else that will happen in this town. I believe that the sidewalk should be far enough away from the curb that there's a proper snow zone, a place where the snow can come in, but not so far away as to create these large stands of grass that will not be used for the road. To justify that we put it at 0.3 meters from the property line because lots of other people do doesn't seem to be correct. We should be doing what's correct for our town. And I'd like to see that come back quite a ways. I like the, I can see that others have had it as close to a meter off the property line. And that reduces that giant green desert that happens between curb and sidewalk. And adds another meter of lawn to the front of the house, which becomes useful. It may become a garden, it may get tree put in, it may have roses or something. So I, I don't agree with the, the idea that the standard that we have right now, that would be 0.3 on the meter off the, uh, off, off, from the property line, is a correct one. It is simply the most common one. So I, I prefer to see it pack up those parts of the meter. Is there anyone uh, that would like to respond to that? Uh, Jamie or Barrio, are you? Uh... Uh, Mr. Galloway? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think um, to be fair to Leah, who put this together, helped out of engineering just a bit before she finished up in the summer. I think you're correct. What she really did was basically gave us a synopsis of what the industry standard is. And didn't really delve a whole lot into the, the um, trying to rearrange the, the profile. So I guess that's what this this uh, report was, was asking for. It um, was the consensus to, for us to go ahead and, and try to redevelop that profile or are we comfortable with where we are? Cut for me. Uh, thank you. Yeah, there's a lot that goes into this uh, discussion of uh, trying to fit all the utilities and everything into the uh, roadway. Um, and we were discussing this at length to try to say, you know, what's the most applicable solution for Midland going forward? Because this is essentially for new builds and new, new developments and new subdivisions. And uh, it, it can it circles back to the official planning exercise and the official planning in it. We've been talking about complete streets accommodating for active transportation infrastructure. So, um, you know, we could amend this current cross section right now and move the sidewalk here or there. But uh, in a year and a half, two years now, we may be adjusting it because our sidewalks might go from 1.5 to 1.8 meters wide. And we might narrow our laneways because, as we know, laneway, narrow laneways are it's built in traffic calming and uh, more uh, more complete streets. It has a uh, you know, parking different things. So we may be adjusting this. So doing this now, we might be revisiting this issue in the future. So uh, I'm comfortable right now with letting this stay as a point three, uh, the simple one foot setback off property line, um, and then we can revisit it once we get some further information because it sounds like there's a whole lot of uh, information that's uh, coming uh, down the pipeline in terms of how to build vibrant uh, successful communities and it all starts with uh, how well you build your roads so uh, uh, yes i know um we haven't had the full opportunity to discuss this here at the table because often the the way it comes to us is because a homeowner has got either a very small piece of sidewalk, you know, that's in front of their house and it's not connected to anything else because other houses haven't been built. Or some homeowners get houses built, they assume their lawn is whatever, and then they are sort of advised that there's going to be a sidewalk that is going to get put in. And uh, at that point, they realized that 
it's going to uh, encroach, you know, on their what they consider their private space in front of the home. And I think that what uh, the discussions that we've had in our committee have uh, really essentially uh, looked at the fact that where those sidewalks are planned for, and that 0.3 meter measurement is actually aligned with a design standard that is the common standard, not just for Midland, but for many other, it's the OPSD uh, standard. And that uh, part of the reason that it's there is because utilities, which are like, you know, your bell lines, your electrical lines, like many utilities that are coming into those very homes and along those very streets are running under some of this land that has been set aside. So, so uh, it's, it's, it's a corridor that is there for many reasons. And then on top of that, from Midland's point of view, the, it's all very well to put the lawn in the summer, but it's really the winter that is most important for us because the snow gets put onto that boulevard. And that snow comes from the road, and that snow comes from the sidewalks. And so, you know, when people are uh, anticipating these things, or when our town uh, engineering staff and our, our snow removal uh, staff are anticipating them, it is partly to make sure that that is a safe enough space to deal with the volume of snow that we get in our community. So it's a really, um, it, it's a number of issues, and, and what we're led to believe in our discussions and as I say, we did have some fairly lengthy uh, discussions. And I'm not an engineer, so I don't, I don't understand all of this. But I do get the idea that uh, the snow uh, banks, I know just from my house on Young Street, you know, those banks can be well over six feet high, you know, because of the very narrow space that is there on what is the rollouts, you know, between the sidewalk and the road, and the snow that, you know, has to get put there from the two sides. So, um, you know, we're, I think, we may want to uh, help our residents maybe in, in looking at this is, is, is just not creating that expectation that they have this big lawn that doesn't have a piece of sidewalk in it. And we have generally allowed developers to wait to do that until later in development. And that's when sometimes we've had pushback. You know, sometimes we've had residents say, we don't even want a sidewalk at all. We think we're quite fine to walk on the street without really understanding that it's more there's more to it than that. And down the road there may very well be residents who do want a sidewalk and feel a bit unsafe walking on the road. So, you know, can we have some residents say that other residents won't have the right to sidewalk when it is part of, you know, what we generally understand to be a safe way to have active transport. So, you know, um, you know, that may help us, you know, and I appreciate what uh, Councilor Kennedy is saying because it does, I think, come across as, you know, unusable space. I have certainly seen some people, you know, use that space uh, very tastefully and they, they planted little garden areas and flowers in that space. Um, but I think it's more the idea that, um, you know, we don't give people that sense that there's never going to be a sidewalk there or if they come and ask us not to, you know, that somehow we will entertain them. And, and that may be a better way of handling this. And that way, when someone moves into a house, there's a piece of sidewalk there, and it's there. And you're not going to have that argument then that maybe, you know, we're going to have this argument about the sidewalk. Let's just tell it all this. It's there. Maybe it needs to get put in earlier. But our understanding is this is not just an aesthetic thing. There really are a lot of changes that would be required because of utilities and the issue of how we do our snow removal. And we need to be changing the way we do snow removal if we want to start changing us. Because there's, it's kind of baked into you know, a lot of related things. But maybe we could reduce the conflict. It uh, looks to me, Council, that uh, tonight we're not uh, going to make a real decision on this. So my suggestion would be we should send it, this to, to the official plan review consultant this letter because that issue will come up in the official plan and it will give us some time to talk about it at other 
sections that are at our own place so that when we do the official plan, we'll have it in the official plan right from the get go. Rather than us make a decision and then the official plan tell us something different. Is that agreeable? Okay. Uh, item number two, Councilor Fyle. Thank you. Um, and Acting Worship, I guess. Uh, Mr. Chair, sir. Um, the next item is an easement agreement. It's a report uh, from Mr. Galloway, our town engineer, and it is recommending that the town enter into an easement with um, a number corporation, which is the uh, corporation that owns uh, a number of the uh, pieces of property on Taylor Drive. And it is for the purpose of accommodating a storm drainage emergency overflow channel. And the uh, reason it's partly coming into existence is that uh, this has been something that has been worked on with the owner of the property and some of the uh, neighboring properties uh, in order to ensure that the grading and the way in which water drains uh, and when this land I gather gets turned over to the town we, at some point anyway, we, we need some sort of official easement in order to make sure that this storm drainage continues to achieve the purposes of making sure water doesn't go where it shouldn't go. Uh, council, uh, any questions? Uh, council, uh, Engineer uh, Galloway, do you have any comments on this? No. Uh, Councilor Conn? Uh, for you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Galloway, uh, I noticed that there wasn't <coughs> any drawings or maps associated with the report. Uh, maybe you could just briefly describe where, where that is on Taylor Drive. Uh, or were they those lots also um, for residential development? Mr. Gallagher. Uh Sure, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councillor Carrington, you're, you're quite right. There should have been a, a diagram attached to this. So my apologies there. Uh, if you can think of uh, Taylor Drive, there's some walkout lots at the corner that uh, the grading is quite sunken relative to the immediate grade around. So the issue was how do we get the water out of the back of those lots? And it had to, in fact, travel across several what are currently unsold lots in order to get to the pond. So this was uh, the, the result of, uh, I won't call it a negotiation, but uh, working together with the residents and the developer to find a solution that, that everybody would agree to, and, and we did. So it's just ensuring that that drainage pathway stays in place uh, in the future. Council, no further questions? Uh, Councilor Conlon, we'll send this on to uh, Council the end of the month. Thank you, uh, Councillor Flav. Uh, in section A, and we go to section C. Councillor uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have a number of items um, for, for bylaws or amending the draft funds for Council coming up in the month. The uh, first one is <coughs> the licensing, licensing bylaw. Uh, this is a report dated October 6, 2016 from the Municipal Law Enforcement Office area, recommending that the staff be directed to bring forward the amendment bylaw to the October Council meeting for consideration. Um, just in short, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> this is uh, a discussion uh, on the authority and approval for the bylaw officer to replace council responsibility for licensing regulate auctioneers, hawkers, and peddlers, uh, fires, markets, and freshman vehicles within the town of Midland. Uh, currently, formality requires a formal resolution of council. Uh, in short, this would be the responsibility as proposed for the municipal law enforcement officer. Councilor Shesh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I certainly support this wholeheartedly. I think this is, uh, this is cutting the red tape as uh, a lot of us campaigned up. Um, just hypothetically, say we decided tomorrow we want to show the leaf game, the first Toronto Maple Leaf game down on 519 Bay. 
we decided that right now we wouldn't be able to have any food there unless we brought it back to council, which obviously we could do by tomorrow. So by passing this, potentially uh, somebody could approach our bylaw and get approval tomorrow and we could be serving hot dogs at the Leaf Game tomorrow night downtown Midland. So I think this is great. Um, I certainly had a bit of struggle with uh, Floaty Fest and trying to wrap everything up uh, at the last minute and get some more uh, food down there as it had to go through council. Uh, probably could have had more vendors, had more options for food had I have, uh, had this bylaw passed at the time. So I certainly support this. I think it's great for people running events and posting things in town and I certainly support this. Thank you. I guess I just, uh, I know sometimes when it has come uh, before us before, um, we do sometimes have a bit of a balancing act. Like uh, sometimes, it, like for example, there's a lot of reference to the downtown areas. Um, and one of the things that has created some uh, stress for the merchants in the downtown has been that you know many of them pay a lot of money for operating their businesses, for being members of the EIA, for um, the efforts year round. You know that that, that they're there, and um, one of the things that you know sometimes happens is if there is somebody who's going to come in and have a very temporary operation and compete directly with somebody who's paying for the full cost of, you know, running this business downtown. Um, you know, they sometimes feel like, well, you know, we're, we're sort of uh, allowing somebody to compete with them without them having to incur a lot of these other kinds of expenses. So, uh, and I believe that one of the tensions, even in Little Lake Park, has been that there is a restaurant there who pays a significant license fee to be in the restaurant, to have a restaurant in the in the in the little Ed park, be there day in day out, week in week out, when it's raining, when it's not, when there's nice weather, when it's not, and so then if others can just come in on a very nice weekend and suddenly like take all the business, you know they feel that there's a little bit of unfairness there. So I, I just I'm just wondering how that balancing act is going to get struck, uh, it, it, you know. I mean, council normally has to take that responsibility because we're allowed to do that. So now we're sort of saying, you know, staff can just go ahead and do it. Um, so I'm just wondering, is there likely to be any other kind of pushback? And I'm wondering, like, has the BIA had an opportunity to see this as the, you know, just to be sure that we're not going to get some, um, like, it's all very well if there's an event that's, sanctioned by the downtown Midland BIA, like that in the plus six. Um, you know, and then it says that certain things would be required, right? So I presume like if we're running a water park festival and they're gonna deal with all the vendors that are there, you know, that's gonna be something that'll be sanctioned by the BIA and we won't have to have so much you know red tape as, as people But but what have, what if somebody what if something isn't sanctioned by the BIA? Like how is that does anybody just still get to put a, you know, a, a card up, you know, into another day? And maybe that's okay, but it's just, I'm just a bit concerned. Have, have we thought through all the implications of this? And are, are we likely to get any pushback? And so should we let this go to the BIA to give us some formal feedback on it? And is there anybody else we should be consulting with, you know, who runs businesses in the park? Uh, I mean, I don't know if one park would I guess, uh, Council, the other thing we could do is allow the bylaw to go to Council. And the majority uh, wins. Uh, and you vote on either having it or not having it. Uh, rather than saying to the BIA that the BIA doesn't run the Council, we make those decisions here. And if we want to defeat the bylaw at the end of the month, I guess. That's how it is, or we say yes to the bylaw at the end of the month, and yeah, that's the consequence that we that we we pass the bylaws here. So I think we got to take responsibility for it, rather than saying, "Well, the BIA made the decision, and uh, we got done with it." 
do with it. So we passed the bylaws here. So, Councilor May. Um, thank you. Yeah, to Councilor Cross's point about um, the balancing action, to Councilor Chesky's point about uh, trying to streamline this, because um, we're looking at it, and it's a little bit disjointed, because we're looking at the added text. We're not looking at the full body of, I know we can dig it up and it's, it's there. So, um, you know, we hate to have this conversation again in two weeks with the full bylaw when we can ask the questions before us right now. So I'll ask the questions is, uh, so the Hawkins and Veterans Bylaw, just so we get some understanding, um, is it a one-time only fee, or is there there's, is there multiple options? Because perhaps that's the solution is that the fee for hawkers and peddlers is uh, has there be a variety of options. There's a one day, weekend, monthly, yearly, whatever. So, I mean, those answers there. Uh, Madam Clerk, thank you. Um, yes, there are. Um, I believe there is a daily uh, and a, and a, an annual, um, but. If, if I'm reading this correctly, I believe this relates to those special events that council has approved. So as council is aware, when you receive a, a request from an individual for a special event, council approves those formally. Um, what this is saying that if there's any hawkers and peddlers or, or vendors essentially associated with that event or refreshment vehicles that are associated with that event, we would then approve them without having to come back to council subsequently with each of those applications. So I'm hearing from that that it wouldn't apply to the Butter Cart Festival or something that, that's normally held a day or whatever, Canada Day at Little Lake and so on. Well, yes. So um, Council is is um, required, yes, to provide special approval for those events if, if they're held on town lands. Um, and then in addition to that, the applicants um, you know, if you're having a hawker and peddler at that event or refreshment vehicles, um, there's approval required. So what we're saying here is that um, there is no special permission of council required at that point. Um, internally, staff can deal with that request. So council, I believe we should allow the bylaw to go through the end of the month and we make the decision at the end of the month. My humble opinion, is that everyone agreeable with that? That's yours. I apologize, let me try to wrap this up. <coughs> for clarification, it was $25 for a one-day permit, $250 for an annual permit, and uh, that's for hawkers, peddlers. Uh, I think the refresher would be a little different. Um, but yeah, um, there's a saying, the rising tide floats all boats or floats all ships. Um, I think if you know we bring a pizza truck down to Little Lake Park, there's going to be people that don't want pizza and they'll get a burger and fries. So I think uh, we're not throwing events down Little Lake Park. We're actually hurting the burger place anyway. So just my thoughts, and I uh, look forward to bringing it to council. Okay, goes to council at the end of the month. Uh, Councilor Cotton, I don't know. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our next one is the Harbor Bylaw. This is the report dated October the third. 2016 from a municipal law enforcement, enforcement officer recommending that staff be directed to bring forward the draft harbor bylaw to the October Council meeting for consideration. In short, this bylaw would provide the town with the ability to deal with a vending boat or a boat that overstays their contract period at the harbor. Purposes to deal with issues arising at our harbor, the boat launch, Future Living Bay Lane property and other town owned water lots in the future. Council, this is a great bylaw. I'd like to hear the comments, please. Councillor uh, Stratton first. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I agree with the sentiment in terms of why this bylaw is being put forward. We currently have an example of a vessel that's in uh, uh, the uh, Miss Midland ramp and uh, it's been sitting there for almost a year and the bylaw officer has very limited means to, to deal with that and so that and a couple of other issues as a point is free for court uh, uh, provide the impetus or the rationale for the bylaw. However, we start uh, about the benefit of uh, feedback to folks who use the harbor and, and boat in the area. And uh, the first thing that we point out is the, uh, the, the, the 
draft does not have a, a, an indication of Chevrolet or what the harbor first day is. My understanding of the harbor is, is it runs from uh, Snake Island across the Wine Marsh and into um, the Great of Down Dock. And if you have to spend a weekend watching how uh, people use that harbor, uh, one of the things that stands out almost right away is that if we limit the speed to seven knots, nobody's getting to a cottage on the water. It's just, it's just too broad, in my opinion, too broad a reach. It should probably be reined in. Uh, it's, speed limits are typically regulate, regulated rather by DOT, and uh, I'm not sure that we want to mess with that, unless there's a very specific reason why I haven't heard one. Um, the, um, there's, a, there's a, a portion in there that speaks to limiting commercial photography, and for the life of me, I don't understand that. Uh, uh, three days old person said, child age commercial photography, filming or videotaping, in, as it says, Collingwood Harbor, uh, or Midland Harbor, and uh, worth mentioning that this bylaw was uh, the contact of municipalities of Collingwood provided a, uh, uh, a template which has worked very well for them. We tried to uh, adapt that, uh, and they'll try to adapt that. Having said that, um, I, I just don't understand why he would try to limit a commercial photographer in, in pursuit of be doing something for to sell to RTO7, to sell to uh, our, 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 our marketing organization, and so on. Um, <clears throat> pleasure, there's a, they speak to uh, the necessity of the uh, pleasure craft. But there's a whole series of pieces in here that are covered by the Department of Transport, federal, federal legislation, transportation aid goods, mentions the cost of tolls, the fact that I have a tank of gasoline since I'm coming to Harvard diesel for uh, It mentions uh, barbecues on the back in boats. I understand, the, the, I think I understand why you might not speak to that, but in fact, there are all sorts of other forms of barbecues that are used, for example, in sailboats on this and on boats and so on, that uh, just by saying marine barbecues are probably covered as opposed to trying to get down to rail barbecues and so on. Overall, I think that the intent is correct, but I think that, ooh, this, this bylaw has gone a bit too far in starting to try and pull in and, and manage where federal statutes already exist. It begs the question then, who's going to enforce it? Uh, is it our FBA going to enforce it? Do we not provide into the best of the and ensure that these things are transpiring the way they should? Or the police already have authorities to, to enforce, for example, speed limits or transportation pages, but it's well, so I would just suggest that we take this up a little bit around some of those things, but the rest of it to me seems uh, uh, that power to the MLA to deal with some of the issues of people and people walking on Dock Beach, abandoning vessels, and give a little more authority to manage our waterfront in, in, in areas where other statutes don't, don't uh, cover and provide the tools. I think, Mr. Chair, yeah, uh, as well said by Councilor Stratton, I've got a few points uh, highlighted here, and one of them was the photography. I think any photography done down at the Middle Harbor is just free advertising for a town, and I think uh, we should encourage it. I think uh, wedding photos, everything, and, you know, word of mouth travels fast, and social media, and all that great stuff. The, the uh, one issue I did understand that we had this year was the, the boats parking without authorization from our staff. I understand one is left now. Uh, but we're still stuck with the one that's docked at the West Midland site. So I certainly get why this uh, bylaw needs to be passed. Uh, I'll keep it short. I support the sentiment of the bylaw, and I, I think it should come to council. Uh, Councilor Ken. Mm -hmm. Is that where you want to insert the bylaw? That's fine. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll,
course, still got to people up by my dad's place on his DC, which would do 40 miles to 40 feet from the shore. I'm not sure we want to be enforcing some of this. Or tell it to the guys who are trying to do the water scheme if we limit the entire harbor to seven miles, get off on the set of steeds. Good luck. Um, again, do we have, do we want to create a law that is already, where a law is already in place? Because then we take over the duty of enforcing the title of the project, which means we desire to enforce some of this. The other one was, I think it was pointed out to me that in section 3.9, it says, uh, an owner shall ensure that all persons operating the vessel have obtained the pleasure craft operating card, which is kind of a step down from the actual box of cards that you carry in the card. Um, let's go on to the next one here. There was a section in here that had something about advertising soliciting uh, signs and that kind of stuff. If our harbor doesn't be cut from Snake Island down to my March, I think they quote, say that as well. Central Marine may find themselves in a bit of a shock when all their signs are suddenly brought in under this new bylaw and controlled through it. At least that's what it feels like this bylaw would do. Is that our intent? I don't think so. The, uh, what else was there that was noticeable? Other than the couple of general spelling mistakes, uh, it seems to be that we just pulled this out. We are trying to remove a boat. We're trying to kind of slay the jack of but we don't need to borrow the sword. We can do this simply with a much simpler pilot. Not something that extends us in areas that we do not have the means for protection to the coast. Go to five. Thank you. Uh, I agree with some of the concerns that have been mentioned. There's, there's a couple of other uh, paragraphs in there. Um, one that says if owners who have a designated mooring slip intend to be absent for a period of excess of 72 hours, they're required to provide a harbor master advance notice of departure and intended return to you. Like that's, you know, we're really getting into regulating people's behavior. Uh, there's other clauses in here about uh, travel. Or you can't have an open uh, beverage, you know, with beer or anything like that. I mean, we have people who are, are using the harbor, they have boats, you know, when we talk about Tuck Fest and, you know, people use the picnic tables on the shore, you know, as an extension of, you know, their, their boat really. And, and, you know, we're inviting people to come to the community to basically share a festive, you know, kind of occasion. And so, um, you know, managing behavior, if there is problematic behavior, we have laws that would be administered by police, like, and that's, I think, the ones that, you know, we would want to say, you know, those standards are the ones that are the criminal code standards. We're wanting to sort of put a whole lot of new standards in here in terms of, uh, uh, I think I saw something about profane language. You know, if we're gonna start telling people how they can speak and what, you know, they can do about the harbor, the issue of how are we enforcing this becomes a big uh, problem because we have a harbor master and a bunch of summer students is, is what I understand. So, you know, we're adding in a huge regulatory regime that I don't know that we actually have harms that we, we need to be administered. If I was paying for a mooring slip and I left and thought that I was going to go, you know, sailing or boating, uh, for 72 hours up uh, in Christian Island or up in, in the park, and the weather changed, and I came back early. It, you know, I wouldn't want to come back and have someone else in my sight because, well, you said you were going to be gone for 72 hours. Like that, I, I just, I just don't think that we could legitimately, you know, to, to do that. And I'm not sure why we would want to get into the business of, of doing that. So I, I think this needs to get seriously pared down to just what is it that we need to do in order to minimize the problem of a boat being abandoned somehow in a harbor and how do we deal with it. If that's the issue, then let's just deal with that issue. Let's not load this up with all sorts of other things that are either dealt with by other levels of government or other um, you know, laws that currently apply to people's behavior. I don't think 
Yeah, we do have a bit of time to send it back to the drawing board, but uh, council, look, uh, uh, all this has taken place because of some incidents that happened last summer where we had a, shall I say, an ugly shift of boat parked up at the waterfront. And to me, that's what we're trying to achieve. I would say, look, if somebody comes along and parks a boat, it's got no authority to do that, that you put a $200 a day uh, bounty on the thing and either pay it or take it away, one or the other. But make the penalty strong enough, not $20, not $30, but enough that you get $200 a day. You park it there without authority, it's $200 a day until you come back. And, uh, to me, you're never going to get at it until you make the poison strong enough. So, do you want to send this to councillor or send it back to staff? A councillor staff. I, I, thank you, Mr. Chair. I certainly understand why we would send this back to staff for um, some molding, but uh, there is some urgency around the timeline, being that we're going to get snow in the next two weeks as we're in the middle, and uh, I should probably let. Uh, Mr. Barrio speak to it further, but I think there is a sense of urgency here in regards to uh, the, the shift we have remaining on the shoreline. Okay, weather forecaster, we get snow in two weeks. No, I, I hope not. <laughs> um, no, the intention is the boats that's parked there, we can't get it moved without this bylaw, so um, we, we can take it back. The likelihood of it being moved before it's iced in will be slim to none then. So uh, we either Pass this, which I'm hearing is not likely, and get the boat moved, or um, the boat will be there for the winter. I would imagine. Uh, Madam Chair, um, if I could suggest, uh, we've definitely made notes on some of the comments that were made by Council. As you know, it is a draft bylaw. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have the schedule included. Staff was still working on that, um, so we'll ensure that we have that, and, and I will also ensure that our municipal law enforcement officer is here to speak to comments. Um, but if I could just ask if council, if there are any additional comments with respect to the draft, please provide it to us by email. The sooner the better, and then we can do a revised draft and bring it forward to council. And if it is uh, approvable by council, we could deal with it that evening um, to advance the business with respect to that that vessel that we're having the current. Sure. Well, I think that uh, we've also had input from residents, and I think that we may want to hear back from uh, other people who use the harbor. So uh, my, my suggestion would be if there is one specific problem that is being uh, considered, that they, the bylaw should just deal with that specific problem. Otherwise, there's going to be more things to talk about, and I will vote against it. So if, if it's just to deal with the problem of that boat, then I would say get rid of everything else that doesn't have to do with how you get rid of the boat that you don't want to have to deal with. And then that way, you know, we can deal with that problem without worrying about how these other boats. Because I've already got emails from residents pointing out problems, you know, with some of this legislation. So I haven't gone through every single thing that I even noticed, but you know, even just what we heard tonight, I and mean, I could go through them all if we want to do that now, but I, I think if, if what I'm hearing people say is people are supportive of trying to deal with that one problem, of how to deal with that boat, and then let's not deal with anything else to do with the harbor, just the boat. Madam Clark. Um, thank you. I, I will, uh, as you said, if you've received emails from the public, please forward those to us as well, uh, so we can consider them in the revised draft. Um, I would suggest, um, you know, I can speak to the municipal law enforcement officer about those key features that are required specific to the vessel, um, and perhaps what will happen is, you know, if that's the case, we bring that forward, then council may, uh, in the future, then see a bylaw to amend um, to provide some further information. That's the current issue that we're having, but you never know what may be happening in the future. Okay, is that agreeable, council? Okay. Proceed to council. Uh, next item, Councillor uh, Cotton, uh, item number three. Yes, thank you. Our next item is the anti-dumping bylaw. This is a report dated October 3rd, 2016 from our municipal law enforcement, <coughs> enforcement officer recommending that staff be directed to bring forward the draft anti-dumping bylaw 
to the October Council Committee for consideration. Uh, what this means, Mr. Chair, is the proposal uh, to expand the definition of refuse and debris and vehicle, and also to allow for staff to remove and, if necessary, dispose of dump items on municipal property. These items include the dumping of watercraft and soil on, top, on town property. Additional provisions for the removal, storage, and disposition of items removed uh, which were illegally placed, as well as the post for cost recovery. Councilor, you've heard the Councilor uh, Chapsky. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I love this bylaw. I think it's a great uh, update. I was going to ask our uh, mayor, deputy mayor, for an update on the green bin uh, legislation that's going through county right now. I'm not sure if you've heard, but there's uh, potentially uh, going to be an enforcement on use of green bin, and if they, you don't use your green bin, they're not going to pick up your garbage. And that was uh, something going through the county. Uh, I'm not sure how it's going, but uh, I'm not sure if staff have any information on that. I assume not. So uh, I think that if that passes, we'll have an issue with dumping. So uh, I think this is great. I think with the, uh, as far as I know, at the county, they had the discussion at the committee level. It's now going to county council to make the final decision. But uh, I don't know what that final decision might be, but <coughs> it was in concurrence with what you talked about, Dr. Pesky, that to, if people don't use the uh, bins properly, the green bins properly, and the waste properly, and they will refuse to pick up waste. And that's done in other uh, municipalities and other areas that seem to make it work. So they want to take that to the country five. Sure. It's always helpful when um, we have laws that are amending if it, it, it really can, uh, and I, I know I've asked for this many times, if, if, if the new draft could like, actually show what is the exact new language in it. Um, just because I recall that we did have some discussions about the issue of leaves and brush and bushes and tree and tree cuttings and plants and things um, it being uh, you know, left at the curb and you know, we were uh, trying to be careful about um, making it a grave offense if people did leave leaves there. So I'm just wondering, is this refuse and debris now expanding any of the language that we currently have? And is this the intention to now, you know, get after residents who may put leaves or other normal, you know, like garden stuff, I guess, you know, either at the edge of their property if they are next to a park or at the uh, curbside if they are, are um, you know, you, you putting it out there without, you know, putting it into the proper bags and things. I'm just, is, is this the intention of this to, to the, the, these offenses be something that our municipal bylaw will now be enforcing to a much greater extent. Madam Clerk, uh, it would be possible to identify changes to a bylaw with a master beside the number or something like that? Um, thank you. Um, in this particular case, it's not an amendment to an existing bylaw. Yes, there is an existing bylaw, but this one decided, as, as you'll note in the draft, it was repealing the existing and creating this new bylaw. Um, what I can suggest is that um, a, a, a number of the areas, including the set fines, which Councillor File had talked about, that had come to Council previously, and that's why there's a differing amount in the set fines. Council directed that um, with respect to um, garden waste, leaves, etc., a fine associated with that be significantly lower. Um, so that is, in this particular case, and as is in the current bylaw, the uh, associated set fine is $100 versus the $500. Um, for other items. Cut for me. Um, yeah, just further to that point, um, I remember when we had this discussion last year, we've been making the transition to, to leaf removal from 
uh, the town of Midland to the county. Uh, it seems like it's going well. The community is uh, responding uh, well. It's unfortunate that you not have to bag it for, you didn't have to bag it, but people are, are, are making the transition and it's, it's, it was difficult for some, but I think when we discussed this last time, the, the bio officer has a latitude of when to, um, it's not a hard line if you, there's one leaf on um, the curb, then that's sort of fine. Um, because as I mentioned before, if a vehicle doesn't have uh, have expired t uh, uh, plates, that's a derelict vehicle. And there's probably several vehicles driving around on our roadways with expired tickets waiting to go up to the Surf Ontario to get them renewed. So there's a latitude either way, but even from our discussion last year, um, warnings and that kind of uh, telling people, hey, these are the new rules, this is what, um, this is how you can uh, fix the solution, seem to be very effective to sort of dealing with some of these issues that we had last year. So warnings seem to be very helpful. So, um, you know, now that when you have the bylaw in front of you, it's kind of like opening up a whole can of worms. You, you want to read every word to make sure it's pretty solid, but it sounds like uh, this comes from a good place and our bylaw officer is um, quite professional and he's, he's very good at dealing with these types of issues. I think the uh, process is running well. Where you run into problems, now I do a lot of walk. Where you find that they have either a contractor or somebody that's just a couple of people just to rake the leaves. They just push them out to the sidewalk and leave them. That, those are the ones you have to get at. Those are the ones you've got to, you've got to do the same as anybody else. So, uh, the resident is paying somebody to, to remove those leaves, but they're put out to the curb. And they just sit there until the snow plow gets them and so on. But uh, the process is working well. Do we still pay the invoice for people if they buy the bags or no? Mr. Barry? No, we do not. We do not. That's good information to send out to the public because up to now we have been paying for those and it's not a big bill, but it's a great incentive for people to know that from today till the end of November or something, you can turn in your receipt that you bought uh, paper bags to put leaves in and we'll refund you that small amount. What was the question you were going to ask? Oh, sorry, uh, Mr. Chair, I think you said that we are going to continue the refunding, and I think we're not. We're not going to continue. And was that a budgetary decision, <laughs> or was it a the intention when we were was just during the transition between uh, us stopping to vacuum the leaves and the county picking them up. So we did it for two years. The intention wasn't to do it forever. No, uh, it's just a suggestion as far as I'm concerned, uh, but it was a great incentive. That's your suspect. Thank you. Uh, do we know the price point on that program, by chance, like the budgetary impact on that program? If you don't have it on hand, no big deal, you can bring it to council. This is coming back in two weeks. <laughs> you give me two minutes, I'll tell you, I think it was $2,500. We, we also, just so you know, we, when we paid the um, reimbursements, we tracked where the bags were going, and I will guarantee you the bags were not going where you think they were going. I think we'll last long as so if somebody comes in with a, re with, a, with, a, with a receipt, we have to tell them that no, that, that, that policy, that may be a great thing to put on your web page, that, that's not applicable anymore. So that we all know <laughs> beforehand that it may not be a good thing to set out, but it's, it's the truth it's not going to be available. Councilor Perry. Hey, I got a raise. <laughs> yeah, um, you sit in my chair. Sure. 
it, it was posted on our website, put out through Twitter, um, I want to say a week ago, two weeks ago. So our communication coordinator has been um, beating the bushes with this stuff. Oh, I know two people I'm going to get a call. <laughs> <laughs> okay, council, uh, we send this one to uh, council in London. Councilor Cotton, are we on a bylaw? Have we got any more? We got lots. Another bylaw. Year is no real. The this is the Midland Public Library bylaw. This is a report dated September the 18th, 2016, uh, from our clerk, uh, recommending that staff be directed to present a bylaw to retroactively establish the Midland Public Library in the Midland Public Library Board to the October Council meeting for consideration. In short, then, just to share, uh, there is no record may have been misplaced over the years. It's a housekeeping item. Uh, the Ministry in the Southern Ontario Library Services recommend, service recommend that a new bylaw be enacted to replace the last one. Uh, the, staff, the, establishment, the establishment of a bylaw is a requirement under the public library act. Council said we were doing everything the library told us to do without a bylaw. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Barry, if I can, the number was uh, twenty-five seventy-seven thirty-seven. So twenty-five hundred dollars seventy twenty-five seventy-seven thirty-seven cents. Council, the last uh, issue that uh, Dr. Cotton talked about, the library bylaw, we all in agreement. We should have one. Uh, Council Five? Just, I guess from a liability perspective, like, are, are there any consequences to the fact that we didn't have a, a bylaw in place, like that we need to kind of remedy or is the literally it's a formality that just seems surprising that something that creates a legal board that's been making decisions for all these years that the legislative board or that may have been missing somewhere in our people so I'm just you know on your head but is it this easy to repair everything <laughs> just pass a bylaw and retroactively say, imagine this has been around for a while? Um, Madam Clerk, uh, you don't have to answer that. That was a lawyer question. Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, so uh, I think it, it's probably, there, there, I'm sure that one was done back in the day, but we're talking many, many days ago, and um, uh, we don't have that record here any longer. Um, the bylaws that date back to that period of time, we don't have here at the town office. Um, so in this particular circumstance, when we talked to the ministry, we weren't the only one that didn't have a bylaw registered with the ministry, um, and they um, advised us that by passing this, you know, we're fine, essentially. Um, it's just really a housekeeping uh, matter more than anything. Yeah, it's, okay. it's just housekeeping. Uh, any further questions? That one is going to uh, council at the end of the month. And item uh, number six. I remember five. Or five, sorry. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> this is uh, the sale of land to 973 and 979 England Crescent property owners. Uh, this is a report dated uh, September the 30th, 2016, from our deputy clerk, recommending that staff be directed to present the appropriate bylaws authorizing the sale of surplus land to John and Virginia Childs. 979 Ingram, Ingram Crescent and Jane Charles 973 Ingram Crescent. In short, uh, Mr. Chair, in 2013, Midland purchased 
small portion of land to use as the Connecticut Trail Lane on the west side of the Georgian Bay District High School. These are the two numbers that I'm referring to, uh, the properties. That existing encroachments on the land and determined that conveying 36 feet of property beyond the rear property lines of the two respective properties. Staff commenced the land transfer process in accordance with the town land sale bylaws. And staff is ready to proceed with the conveyance of the land to the two property owners. It's also on a cost recovery basis. Council, sure. you've heard that uh, bylaw. Uh, I have a concern, but I'll wait until after. Is there any, uh, any questions related to this one? My, my question uh, would be <clears throat> Is there anybody else along that corridor of Ingram Crescent or that laneway that would want to do the same as these two people? If there is, you should clean it up all at the same time. You could easily just notify the other residents along there, it's not a lot of people, so that you could clear it up once and for all that the other people along that corridor didn't want to have that land. That whole thing happened to me when I lived on 2nd Street. I got permission. The rest of the people were really up in our department that were not even asked. Maybe they don't want it. They want it to be asked. So, is that possible? Right. Um, uh, yes, actually, um, you're correct in um, the fact that uh, the other um, adjacent property owners were not um, offered the opportunity, and it was it's actually because um, it would have impacted the trail link. Uh, it was determined that these the the, um, the sale of the the 36 feet beyond the property line to these respective property owners would not impact the trail link, but but if it was to proceed down along the line, then it would. Um, I guess I'm just wondering, when I look at the map, it, it looks as if the owner of 973 and 979 in the referred to in the body of the report are the ones that are getting to add a piece of property, but it looks like 965, which is right beside 973, the 0.08 of an acre I'm looking at this map right that's being added is is to 973. Some of it is behind 9765 as well, which seems odd. Like why it wouldn't be broken so that you know, just as the nine in other words that the piece should be adjacent to like why does nine seven three get a piece of land that's behind nine six five as well as nine seven three? Uh, yes, the land that is being conveyed is directly behind 973. There is no um, portion of that piece that is being um, that is on um, 965. Um, and the reason also um, that these two property owners um, were provided with the 36 feet is because they have existing encroachments on the property, on the town lands. So the the way the drawing has these orange lines, it's not going all the way back to the orange line. It's just a small piece that, okay. Okay, we all, uh, all clear with that one? Okay, that'll come to council in the end of the month. And item number six, council done. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our next item is the Deputy Treasurer Recruitment. Uh, this is a report dated October 6, 2016 from our Director of Finance and Treasurer recommending that the above report be received as information. The information and discusses that there is a need for a full-time Deputy Treasurer. Uh, there is no financial impact on the budget. 2017 with this recruitment. Uh, for you, Mr. Chair, open for discussion. 
council uh, got any questions? Council five. I guess if I go back in time to uh, the uh, KPMG report, it was my understanding that the the consultants who came thought there could be some adjustments, I guess, to the staffing in the finance department. And so when this position wasn't like it was in part because of some thoughts, I guess, that perhaps there could be some adjustments to the way work was done in the finance department in terms of the staff complement that was there. So I, I'm just wondering where that stands like in terms of the review. I, I appreciate that the new staff are looking at that and we had an interim CAO who looked at it as well a little bit. And so I'm just wondering like, where does the earlier analysis of is there some other ways in which some of that work could be done without having to have the full complement of staff? Let's hear from our new treasurer. Uh, our new treasurer hasn't said anything yet tonight. We've got to get her into the mix here. So, Ms. Uh, Turnbull. I, I do thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> um, since the KPMG report, two positions in finance. Oh, I'm not speaking close enough. Excuse me. Um, can you hear me now? Since that report that Councillor Klein mentioned, two clerical positions have been eliminated from the finance department. What I found when I came in is that Treasury staff are working extremely hard, but every day we slip behind. They simply don't have the professional training and the breadth of experience to do what needs to be done. A number of them, over time, can be brought higher in their performance, but that won't happen overnight. At this point, to meet some of the issues that are pressing, management reporting, asset management, plus a budget process that is behind already, as you know, requires that we look at some professional assistance. Thank you. Council, any further questions or comments? Me. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so just to follow up to Councilor Cross' question in terms of um, um, organizational um, structure, um, we had a deputy treasurer and then we also had a financial controller and they seem to be very similar in job titles, job descriptions. Um, is that something, are they interchangeable or is it, we're we going with one rather than something else? The recommendation at this point is to hire a deputy treasurer, which is the original, based on the original job description. However, it will be advertised as under review because almost every position in that department, the, the alignment of duties so that accounting principles can be undertaken properly and so that we can look at processes will need to potentially be altered over time. But, um, I believe this title, Deputy Treasurer, in a financial world, or at least a municipal financial world, gives us the best opportunity to hire someone who can hit the ground running and actually assist the municipality, council, management, and myself in moving us forward more quickly. Thank you. Okay, Council, uh, that will come to uh, Council at the end of the month as well. That will bring back. Sure. Thank you. Uh, that was actually just an informational item, so there will be no motions coming forward. Okay. All right. Dr. Fox. Thank you. I was actually curious about the idea that it's received as information because uh, I believe that there was a policy that was approved by council that if there was a vacancy, uh, it couldn't be filled without a review by council. So I thought that that was something that did actually get passed, and so. I would have thought that the replacing of this position would still require 
Google it. I'm so, so I, I may be wrong, but I know we've had some discussions about this before because we thought that it had been something that had been passed, and then we were told that it wasn't, and then we sort of, I thought, got it passed again. So that any any uh, time there is a, a retirement or a uh, someone leaves a position, that council was to review the need for replacing that position. So I'm, I, I, maybe it's just an information discussion, but I just would like some clarification as to whether or not we need to approve the replacement. Replacing of that position. Our CAO. John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to uh, Councillor File, uh, certainly your administration will undertake a review to see if, in fact, uh, your understanding and interpretation of what you believe Council had originally enacted in terms of having uh, any vacant position come back to Council for confirmation. We'll undertake that between now and the Council meeting. We'll get, get clarification for that. It's my understanding, however, that this position was never removed from the complement. I believe that the instruction was to run vacant uh, for a period of time to allow for, I believe at that time, the treasurer was being mentored by uh, uh, another individual. And so I believe at that time uh, there was an understanding amongst council that we were going to keep it vacant until uh, that process had uh, come to a conclusion. As you know, uh, the position was vacated, the treasurer's position was vacated. We went back to uh, first principles. We recruited for a treasurer, and uh, obviously, uh, at this point in time, we're now going back to revisit uh, the vacant deputy treasurer position. So it's my understanding, but we will clarify for the benefit of council by the time of the next uh, this matter comes before council, we'll have clarity around what the uh, determination or decision council was vis-a-vis -vis the deputy treasurer's position. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem uh, voting to support the replacement given the staff was recommending that it's needed. It was just more, we, we did have council discussions previously about that position and that's what I was more asking is like, does, is it just to be accepted as the commission, or do we need to actually vote on it, given some previous discussions? Good. Dr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my recollection of the position uh, was that it was put in advance per, uh, per the CAO's description. It actually came forward for discussion in front of council, the position still stood, the budgetary component was still there, and uh, the, the, the discussion then became about uh, what would we hire as a, a deputy treasurer or some title uh, if we weren't quite sure what the structure of the department would be. We then subsequently brought in an interim CAO with significant experience as a treasurer. And he took a look at the department. We, we basically backed off, agreed to the notion of looking for a treasurer with the notion that the treasurer would then come in and make an assessment, which we see tonight. But that, that position was never really in the books. That's why I said it. Otherwise, it might happen. I also understand the need. I got the number. I understand that these are tools from a hard place for a skill set. And there's a lot to be done in a, in a very short time. So it's, it's, a, it's not a very high professional health to this tool. And I would expect that that individual can have had to that conversation in terms of process review and also uh, you know, assisting the, the treasurer in terms of looking at what uh, structure might unfold while getting the business done. So, Council, that's to us as information, and we'll get further information that Council in. So, clarify the issues. Uh, we're at um, other business. Uh, any other business? Uh, Dr. Strath. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there's a, um, a program that's put on by Aviva. 
called the uh, Aviva Community Fund, in which Aviva will put money into uh, projects that are put forward by various organizations across the country. There are basically uh, three categories with two funding levels, under fifty thousand dollars per, per project. Um, in, in Finland, we have uh, we're fortunate that we have uh, three actual proposals for the Aviva Community Fund uh, this year. Uh, one is for the splash pad that uh, uh, currently currently has fourteen hundred. Uh, one is for the guest house in terms of completing the guest house and uh, get that uh, done for what you're saying. That has 1,457 votes, and there's uh, one for the uh, library maker space, and it's, uh, I don't think, I have the same publicity. So I'd like to, first of all, plug in for this whole thing. I believe that the town website will have links. Uh, Uh, to each of those. So fundamentally, you go on the site, you register on the site, and then you have 18 votes that you can apply to projects that you uh, just uh, to support your vote. Uh, presumably, everybody from the Midland and their friends will support the uh, project from it, uh, whichever they feel is appropriate. I just, uh, so I would ask people to go to the Midland website and see the link, uh, the links in there support their, their big favorite project. I'd just also like to say that what the makerspace is, because a lot of people don't know, is a facility for young people to come in and work with 3D printing machines, perhaps a laser cutter, perhaps uh, some, a web design work or a green room, uh, those sorts of things. And so it's projected uh, the library will be undertaking a makerspace facility uh, in 2017, starting to put that in play. These funds would would help uh, the library to accomplish that. And likewise, with the splash pad, there's been a lot of support for splash pads, taken by the building. And, and also, of course, the guest house has uh, been working very hard to complete the facility. So I'd like to see if the community get behind this. And uh, we'll go and register and uh, please you exercise your franchise. Thank you, sir. Dr. Hesh. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think the Aviva thing is great. It's good to see uh, so many people getting involved. Between the three causes, we have uh, over 3,500 votes, so I think that's great, seeing people in the community rallying behind local causes. Uh, that wasn't what I wanted to talk about, though. I wanted to formally announce to Council that Action Play Center is coming to the Mountain View Plaza. It's an indoor playground uh, similar to the former Fun Stop, but we used to have one on the street. So it's a uh, Mike and Jennifer Hearn. I uh, work with North Simcoe Community Futures. Uh, this just shows that hard work, dedication can uh, make your dreams come true. These were real Midland people who got creative and created a business that will bring people to town. It will keep people in town that are currently traveling uh, to Barrie for the service. And it will provide safe, affordable recreation for youth at $10 per day. It's a win-win-win and uh, I wish them the best. And that will be in the Mountain View Plaza uh, where the former bank used to be. So, support local. Thank you. Come for me. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, two, uh, two items. Uh, one quickly, uh, uh, was that fortunate enough to be at the Newman Cultural Center for the Share, Sharon and Bram concert, which uh, it was just full of kids and it was full of songs and I, I had more, uh, I, had a, I enjoyed it more than my son did. Uh, but Sharon is a Butter Tart fan and so she uh, hopefully will be able to invite her back for June 10th Butter Tart Festival. So I just want to thank the Midland Cultural Center and the Family Scene. They have a specialized program that focuses on children's programs. So it was a great Great event, and um, it was great to have them. But most importantly, I wanted to mention to the to my fellow counselors the Vital Signs Report. It was just launched last week, uh, and the mirrors uh, covered an article on it. But it's important to take a look at it. As we always discuss, evidence-based policy making. It has a lot of great uh, data in there that's very relevant to when we make decisions about affordable housing, active transportation, uh, population. Uh, so it's a great report, uh, and, and it can be accessed through Simcoe Muskoka Vital Science .ca, and there's a lot of great information on there. So uh, just want to thank thank them, uh, thank the organizing group because I was a I was the Midlands representative on it. So it was a, it was a great experience to see and see the performance, and appreciate all the, the hard work that went into that. Thank you. Dr. Platt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I have two things. Uh, one is um, and. Uh, uh, did uh, 
in my reply to an email that we got last week on informational items on the general committee, PDC, and council agendas, I did try to reply all, but uh, it seems I'm not permitted to send an email to all council uh, from my computer, so I don't know how that operates. I'm going to have to, I guess, send you have to send individual councilors. So. But uh, this was an email that we got last week, and I just said I would like it to be raised tonight, uh, this question, uh, because um, I wasn't sure what all informational reports were no longer going to be on our agendas um, for general committee and PBC. And so my understanding is that the water quality reports are generally received for information. The building reports we usually get on the PBC and the bylaw report. Uh, are typically ones that we get on the agenda. And so I'm just, uh, I know there's other reports, but those were ones that I was a bit concerned about them kind of being removed from our agenda to the council information packages. Um, and I appreciate that, you know, the council information packages are where often, you know, minutes of committees and annual communications and, and many things that uh, we need to look at are, are there. But uh, I find that um, for myself, you know, reading the several hundred pages, you know, on the PDC, on general committee, like those are the ones that I always read everything. And the water quality report in particular, I know is legally our responsibility to read. Like, it's the one thing as counselors that we actually are required. And so I'm just, uh, it's more of a, is a request, so I'm just trying to understand because um, I, I get the idea that we want to efficiently, you know, move things through council, and you know, if we don't need to speak to something, perhaps it doesn't need to be on the agenda. But typically, those three are ones that we almost always have some sort of comment. Like I know at PDC, the building report, uh, although it is just for secret information, there's almost always uh, a great deal of interest in the number of, you know, new building permits that. Given. And I just would hate to have to wait through the council information package. I tend to scan it uh, to sort of say, okay, well, where is that water quality report? Because I want to be sure I find it you know, in them on every week. So just, I, I don't know whether we might have any discussion tonight as to whether those three reports are still going to be on them or what other information reports are now not going to be on those agendas because the email didn't specify which. I think the instruction uh, from our clerk was that if you needed one to be discussed, you could pull it off and have it on the committee report. Uh, Madam Clerk, is that still the case? Um, thank you. Yes. Um, the process, so this is a process that was in play when the council information package um, was created, which was back, I believe, in early 2014. Um, and one of those things that could have been included in that or that was approved to be included were informational reports. Um, so uh, when our new CEO came on board and he was reviewing the agenda, he asked the question um, with respect to the purpose of the council information package. Um, so um, the intent is to provide those reports to council that are um, informational only. There's no direction required. Um, and as indicated uh, in the email and in our policy as well, should council wish to discuss one of those informational reports at a meeting, they can request it by emailing either uh, myself or our deputy clerk, Karen, and then that informational report would then appear under the correspondence section of the next council agenda for discussion. Um, as Councillor File indicated, uh, yes, there is a number, of idle, a, a number of items in the council information package, um, but those informational reports are, are identified under media type as informational reports to help zone in on them for council. Um, you would have, the last package that you received um, on Friday would have included those informational reports that would have previously been in this agenda this evening. So for instance, that would have been um, the um, Midland Public Library provides us with a monthly informational report, um, the Tourism Special Events monthly report, the Bylaw monthly report, um, and as Councilor File indicated, also the monthly water report. And I am speaking with the Director of Operations to ensure that um, we are meeting the legal requirements. So if there is a change required, we will include that, of course, um, for a, a formal council agenda. Um, but that, that is the intent of why this is being brought forward. Again, it is a way to, to continue to streamline the council process. 
as well uh, across the file. I think uh, to get to council, uh, if you type in council when you're sending an email, it goes to everybody. Right? So then it's it's strictly uh, information for council only. Um, I think, um, if I may, the, the issue that Councillor Fowle may be having with her email, that's an IT type of an issue. Um, and I, we can speak to our IT um, staff to, to provide you with some assistance. This council information package, as, as sorry, I, I believe you were indicating as well, is provided um, to the public. Um, on our website, and it is also included um, in the uh, monthly council agenda as well. Um, so, it, from the public's perspective, it is also very uh, transparent from that, from that piece. Okay. <laughs> well, I guess I just I would like to request that the monthly water report still stay on the agenda. That's the one that I feel that we are legally required to read. I, I understand that we go to the other ones that are in leisure and that uh, you know, if we want to look at them, we can. But I, I'm just uh, concerned. I know in my own schedule, I will probably miss reading that somewhere <laughs> because you know, it will come on the time when I'm reading other things. And I, I just want to be sure that the water report is one that we always do put our mind to because just from the email conferences I've been at, it's the one that we're supposed to be sure of. Everything else I think we don't need to, but that one I just would like to request to still be on. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, again to uh, Councillor File. So the intention here is to look at those kinds of reports that do not require action by council. If there was a water report that came in, our chief water operator would be obligated under the legislation to bring the report forward to council to address remedial action. So it's no different than uh, the treasurer filing on a monthly basis or quarterly basis remittances uh, to the uh, auditor uh, or to uh, the uh, pr provincial uh, government in terms of filings for uh, purposes of uh, tax remittances or uh, uh, employment uh, insurance requirements, uh, CPP requirements, uh, whether it's federal or provincial in nature. Um, those kinds of uh, control mechanisms are things that um, unless someone's triggering something for you, uh, you should have assurances that, in fact, we are complying with the legislation. First and foremost, it's my obligation uh, as the uh, Chief Administrative Officer for the Corporation to ensure that our staff are complying with their statutory obligations. And it's, it's clear that the statutory obligation of the Clean Drinking uh, Water legislation falls upon our Chief uh, uh, Water Operator. And so from that perspective, when those reports come in, uh, it's my intention to ensure that the chief water operator provides assurances to council that if it appears upon an information report, that means that you are free and clear of any concerns associated with your water system. If, in fact, there's a problem, then uh, trust me, it's not going to be on an information report. You will have a full-blown report advising that there was a, an issue concern was addressed as follows. So uh, I want you to have some of the degree of assurance that your administration is not going to just be sliding these things through for the purposes of somehow uh, not identifying problems for you. Uh, under the legislation, there's liabilities that accrue right throughout the entire organization. Just as you can be in prison, so can I. So from that perspective, trust me, I'm not going to sleep well at night if I know that the water quality reports have some sort of concerns that we should all be addressing. So I want council to have that level of assurance that that's something that we would be bringing forward as quickly as possible so that you would have some degree of comfort knowing full oh, well that someone is actually reviewing these reports, looking at them and ensuring that uh, we're responding in that program. Just the other thing that I, I guess I have some concerns with is just when we jump around 
on the night. It, it, it is actually a challenge sometimes uh, if we're like trying to draw in something from another place. Uh, the public doesn't have to report on it. It's not in front of you know them on the agenda. So it's it does make it a little bit more complex to have you know those discussions uh, to, to refer. I, mean, I don't mind requesting things off of the CIPs. I have done it before, but I have been trying to keep to a minimum of that just because it is awkward for staff and for the council. So that's why I was trying to say, you know, one in particular I'd like to see stay on the agenda just so that we can put our minds to it. But um, I don't mind asking anyone to come from the CIP. It's just that I know that it's also more work for staff than for us to determine the agenda. Uh, thanks again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think most of the council will recall that uh, when I was before you and you were uh, considering whether in fact to uh, retain me uh, for the purposes of the chief administrative officer's role, one of the things that I did indicate to you was, or my question to you was how amenable was council uh, to change? Uh, and as part of the change process, I, I believe we have to overhaul our procedural bylaw quite substantially. Uh, to modernize it, to uh, ensure that from a government's perspective, uh, your focus and your attention are on critical issues that are important from a government's perspective. Uh, I think you have to have a certain degree of trust uh, in terms of your administration's ability to manage, uh, but certainly strategic direction and policy guidance and, and, uh, and, and certainly policy direction are critical. And so uh, from that perspective, this is a partnership, uh, very much so, in, in the sense that we have to provide you with the assurances that we're doing our job, but at the same time, uh, we have to also help you uh, to uh, operate from a governance perspective that allows you not necessarily to get into all of the details, but have assurances that the details are being administered properly. And, and that's going to take a bit of time. Uh, there's going to be some growing pains. Um, but I've already indicated to our clerk that uh, that's one of the, the, the key priorities is to look at the procedural level uh, because there are a lot of opportunities as we look at, as I look at it, and based on my experience working for a number of different jurisdictions, that we can certainly change the dynamics around the, top, uh, the council table in terms of improving both council's performance, the public's expectations, and certainly uh, eliminating what I see as somewhat of a treadmill where you've got your staff going back over and over and over again in terms of certain issues and reports. So I think how we share information with the public is going to be a lot more critical for us at the front end of the exercise, especially on things like, and I'm sorry for deviating, but even some of the bylaw issues this evening. I would much prefer to see a public consultation exercise before we get it to the council table than, than what we're currently doing. And, and our processes today hamper that. So if we're going to be more transparent in terms of how we deal with the public, we're gonna to have to have a lot more flexibility in terms of delivery on, on that uh, mandate. So I, I would hope that that's something that this council will be receptive to uh, in terms of moving forward, in terms of changing the way we do business. Because if, if, if I can't convince council to change business, it's gonna be difficult for me to convince people sitting around this table and the rest of the organization to change the way they do business. That is very good. Thank you. I have a second item, and that was um, I circulated uh, using everybody's names um, a report that was from the Columbia Institute that uh, has recently been published on top asks with respect to climate change. And we had a discussion at our PDC meeting last week with respect to some of the provincial uh, growth plan um, proposals, I guess for, for lack of a better word, uh, and, and our staff had identified some things that we might want to kind of push back on a little bit. Uh, in part, I think, because um, you know, that's looking at very much within the planning framework. And one of the things that was in the Columbia Institute uh, top ask on climate change in terms of asking federal and provincial governments 
for some leadership, I guess, around climate change, which is becoming increasingly more urgent as, you know, the Paris Agreement has now been adopted and as we all try to address it, was to formally require smart growth principles to be in land use plans. So that's one of the asks. So I know there's some tension between where does it make sense to look at climate change, and I know the idea of putting greenhouse gases you know, in official plans and some of the other kinds of ideas that were being discussed by the province you know, was one that we were sort of uh, you know, talking about in the planning frame. But I wonder if, um, you know, we, had, we didn't really look at it from the sustainability frame. We didn't really look at it from other frameworks, which is understandable because you know, we were looking at it in the form of our planning team. And so I'm just wondering whether we want to encourage our staff to kind of maybe look at some of those, the, the things that we might be saying to the province of Ontario about those proposals from a little bit more comprehensive point of view uh, in terms of how do we as a municipality take some leadership ourselves in terms of um, addressing some of the climate change so I know, uh, for example, you know, we weren't supportive of the idea of mapping the agricultural lands or you know, natural uh, you know, sections. Like there's a number of things which, which from the perspective of just drawing a map would make sense from maybe our official plan. Maybe that's not the best place that we want to deal with. But we didn't really kind of add in, okay, well, how could we make a suggestion to the province to better look at how will we make sure that we can address local food security? Or how do we look at you know, encouraging uh, production of agricultural food within municipal boundaries? And also that notion that even though Midland, you know, we make our official plan you know, in our own boundaries, many of these climate change and natural and smart growth issues are really about looking at regions. So whether it's source water or whether it's some of these broader uh, natural ecosystem approaches, you know, that's what I think the problem is getting at. And so I know when we were in our sustainability meeting, we're talking about that stuff from these bigger perspectives. So I just worry, I guess, that we may have uh, narrowly looked at, at some of those recommendations. And so do we want to encourage staff to sort of maybe, you know, talk with each other or interdisciplinary tables, you know, that's not you know, you know, so that when we bring that back to the council meeting, a more comprehensive approach and perhaps some of these suggestions that are in the Columbia Institute of Asked report might get considered. We didn't have that at the time. And maybe there are some that you know our council would want to would want to consider as well. Because I think this is a time of a great challenge for every level of government to look at how we meaningfully address climate change. And, and I'm, if we don't like what the comments is saying, I, I think we should be trying to come up with some suggestions to them of what we do like. Um, and I, I'm not sure how we do that, because you know, where we have that discussion, uh, you know, the best. That is, uh, Dr. Feil, that's one of the items that our CAO has confirmed to us, that he will monitor and bring it back to council at the appropriate time and so on that uh, uh, to know that we are doing having the same information as everybody else. Those are things that we should leave in the CAO's hands that he bring it back to us at the appropriate time and place. That can be done because those reports are all reviewed by the That report will be coming back to the council at the end of the month, or at least the one that we discussed with PDC. And I just wasn't sure if we want to make changes to it. Are we going to do that at the actual council meeting then? Like, because we did, we didn't, we don't really have another location, I guess, where a more interdisciplinary approach could be taken. That's an uh, item I, I firmly believe that our CAO will have. A conversation with the planning director and then we will make that decision with uh, Dr. Stratton. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My recollection of the conversation was with the report forward, as written. Um, and Councilor Pyle since has honored the request of the Columbia Institute report, which was a 74 page report I took the time to read, and it has some very good recommendations. I think most of it is to do with going back to the federal government and to the province and saying who has the responsibilities. And who has the tools in the toolkit uh, that may put the bear on climate change. But what we were asked to look at was the items within the Planning Act that was under the Planning Development uh, Committee and, and Council agreed at that meeting to move the report forward as written. So I, 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 I would suggest that it may not hurt to attend the, the climate change. Uh, Useful but to append to Columbia a report or at least a reference to it to the climate might assist and they credit. Uh, in fact, in that document, the Columbia report, they mentioned some of the initiatives in Ontario as that being uh, worthwhile, worthy of note from a province perspective and so on. But a lot of the subject matter in that report is outside the purview of what we were asked to consider, which was the actual planning. I take Councilor Bob's point, but I'm not sure. This is the this is the mechanism to, to address that. I mean, maybe the association or would have told about uh, address that I can told but I, I just don't uh, see this dovetailing particularly well with what we were asked to consider at the planning development. So I my best I can see is just depending the reference to the Plumbery report is a good read. I would encourage others to read it. There's some interesting things in there, but but I certainly wouldn't uh, uh, Go point by point reviewing reviewing what we've already suggested to the plan for. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, with regards to this particular aspect. Uh, the challenge we have uh, as a municipality within the province of Ontario, uh, within the federal uh, legislative system in terms of the Canadian uh, government's model, is the fact that our Planning uh, Act is a creation of the provincial government. And, and with that comes a series of policy statements, uh, a series of directives in terms of uh, requirements for municipalities uh, to consider as part of the objectives. The difficulty is uh, that I would suggest to you that the whole issue around climate change uh, not only affects land use planning principles, but it affects everything from infrastructure uh, design uh, to uh, you know, house construction, so building code, uh, uh, stormwater retention requirements. Um, so there's a whole series of issues that impact how we as municipalities react and respond to climate change. Uh, in as much as it would be nice for us to be able to structure uh, our planning documents take all of these factors into consideration, chances are we're going to miss something along the way because things are going to continue, continuously evolve from a legislative perspective. And our, our mandate really is to consider the directives that come from the provincial level. And as much as the federal government's going to influence the province with regards to things like carbon tax and things like that, um, that will be something that gets pushed down through regulation, through uh, legislation down to the local level. For us to get ahead of that is a bit of a dangerous situation because uh, I'm not sure where it's all going to end up and I'm not sure in terms of the mandate of, of the current uh, government in terms of how long that mandate will continue. But sooner or later, there will be clarity on the horizon. And in as much as uh, I have a great deal of respect uh, for uh, the work uh, that we've identified in terms of, uh, of this report, the challenge is there are probably just as many professional associations out there that are also providing opinions and directions with regards to where municipalities should be focusing their attention. And so, given the limited resources we have, my suggestion is our best strategy today is to wait to see where the province comes out in terms of defining greater clarity in terms of its position papers, uh, its policy approach, and the directions that they give uh, to us through uh, regulation and legislation. Uh, 
Uh, with that being said, we also have to ensure that whatever we do from a land use planning perspective complies and dovetails into the uh, county uh, official plan. So there's this, what I would call almost like the, the Russian ball syndrome where you know we fit in, but we're probably just a small player in, in the, the, that nesting of dolls so that you know we have to also comply with uh, the bigger mandate, the bigger uh, direction that comes to us uh, from the provincial government and through legislation. So um, rather than get ahead of it, even though we're currently going through uh, an official plan amendment and that whole policy review process, I think what we need to do is we need to wait to see where the direction is going uh, uh, to take us. And in the absence of that, as much as the uh, the, uh, the Columbia uh, report is important, the Institute's uh, information is important to us because it provides some insight as to where some leading practices are going. Until we get embedded in legislation, it's really tough for us to, to try and, and get ahead of it and to embed it into documents that form our policies. Now, I think if, if there's anything I've learned in the short period of time that I, I've, I've been here is that uh, there is a, uh, a reticence on the part of the community in general to get ahead of a legislative framework, even the issue this evening before you in terms of uh, the harbor bylaw. Very clearly, the, the, uh, the overarching information or, or uh, concept that I take back is, let's not exceed our reach. Let's make sure that what we're trying to do fits with the direction that council's providing uh, to us. And at this point, yes, so I wouldn't want to fall to one side of, of the uh, discussion until we understand clearly where's the province and where's the federal government ultimately going to land on all of these issues that are going to have impacts land use, infrastructure, and, and whole range of uh, matters. You have the last question. Well, just I, I don't disagree with you. I, I agree with uh, what you said completely. It, it's just that the the we did weigh in in that responding document that we looked at, and that's the thing is we're not just waiting to see what the province and the feds do. We've taken some pretty strong positions in that PDC response that the planner uh, drafted. So th that was my worry is that. You know, by stepping into the breach, you know, we, and taking the strong positions that we did on a number of things, then, you know, we're telling the province, we're not saying, let's wait and see what you guys do. We're saying we don't like the direction that you're going in. So, so that's 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 what's going to come to council is a vote on a whole bunch of positions. So it was just we didn't have any other documents when we were reviewing that. We only had document.